What's up everyone? Welcome to this video on daily data. So daily data is another numeracy routine that you can incorporate in your room. It could be a center activity. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that. Let me show you how it works and we'll talk about how you can implement it in your room. Daily data is a team building activity. And I say that because uh, students are actually working together. They're working individually, right, to input some data, but then they're working together to see how the data fits and if it works or if there are errors or outliers. So it really depends, like the whole class, this is like a collaborative effort. So I call this a team building um, routine. So for daily data, you would use a variety of uh, methods to collect the data. So you guys are all familiar with graphs, and we'll talk about that a little bit later, but Venn diagrams is something that we use to collect data as well. So here's what you do. You put up a prompt like you see here, and then you have students, if you were to write this prompt on the board, you would give the students post-its, they would write their answer and place it accordingly to the, the diagram, the Venn. Um, however, if you do this digitally, you can still have this up, display it on whatever digital system you have, and students can drag and drop um, their answers into the appropriate spots. So students are either putting their answer in the loop or outside of the loop because it would be an outlier. All right, so here's our prompt. The prompt is the number of letters in your first name and last name combined have a sum that's less than 16. That is a prompt we would give our students. So students would have to figure out, okay, if I combine my first name and last name, how much would that give me? What would the sum be? And then as you can see here, students would take their post-it and, or again, digitally, it could be something that they drag and drop. For this, let's just say post-its. So they would take their post-its and they would put it accordingly to this, to this uh, single loop. So now if their sum is less than 16, they would put it on the inside and you can see those numbers there that are less than 16. Now if the sums were greater than 16 it would be put to the side outside of the loop and that is the outlier, right? That's the piece of data that does not fit in with what we're looking for. And then you basically gather the students to talk about what they notice about the data. So there's conversations about this after they even solve and place their post-its up. You can ask students to make statements off of this data. For example, students may notice that there are more kids in the class that have um, first and last names that are less than 16. The sum is less than 16, if we were to base it off this example. So an example of a statement a student can make is, well, I notice that there are two kids in the class. Again, there's not, they're not named. There's two kids in the class that have really short names because I see the number five and six, and those are the lowest amount we have. So that's something that students can see as a statement based off the data that they see. They're interpreting the data. Another student may say, well, I notice that there's only one person. Again, we're basing it off this example. <laughs> I notice that there's only one person with an extremely long name where the sum is 22. You can have conversations with students. Well, why do you think that the 22 was placed outside of the loop? And then they would have to explain and justify. And then, I mean, it, it could be, the questions vary. It could be extended in any type of way. Students can say, well, I noticed that there's this many even numbers and this many odd numbers. I noticed that there are, you know, a prime number. Like, you really, students can actually make any type of observation. This is not a fixed set uh, responses that you want. You really want students to just explore, just notice what's in this data and justify that to you. Now you really wanna get creative with the prompts. I recommend starting the prompts off really basic at first so students can understand the routine and they're not used to uh, interpreting data in this way. I mean, data is one of the standards that oftentimes is left towards the end of the year, right? Uh, in our pacing guides, which is wrong. Um, and um, not just that, we focus solely on like bar graphs and line plots. We don't extend their thinking about data. So they're not used to this thinking. So start off with the prompts really being basic and then transition to the prompts being like really juicy. So uh, let's take a look at this one. The digits in my student number create a sum less than 30. 
So this makes it like the other one really personal. It's about them. And I should explain here by student number, I mean like sometimes students get like a student ID that they use uh, in school for like their lunch or whatever. Now again, students do not have to actually write their information, their student number. They would really just write the sum. But let me explain how this would work. So let's say that my student number is that, 42571. So the students would have to take those digits and add them together in order to create a sum. And then they would really have to decide, okay, based off this number, where would my post-it go? So my sum is 19. I know that it's less than 30. I'm going to put it inside the loop. So students start off with something like this, right? Basic. But then we add that extra piece. That double loop um, Venn diagram is, oh my God, it is so good for collecting data. So look at what I just did here. I still have the same prompt as before. And students would, right, put down if their sum is less than 30. So I believe I had 19. But now I added a second piece of data that they would have to interpret. So is their student number less than 30 or an even number or both, right? Because that's that middle of the Venn. So here's an example of what kids can do. So students would, again, interpret it. So I see 7, 13 or less than 30, and I know those are not even numbers, so I'm not gonna place them in the middle, right? Now on the even side, I notice I have 46 and 58. Those are even numbers, but they're not less than 30, so that's where those would go. And in the middle, I have 16, which is a number less than 30, but also an even number. But I want to talk about those pieces that are highlighted here, that stand out. Let's talk about that 39. Some students are going to put a 39 or, you know, some students are going to put a post-it in the wrong spot. And why is it in the wrong spot? Well, that number is not less than 30, so it wouldn't go there. Let the kids do that. Let the students put it in the spot. Don't interfere. Don't get in their way. Because when you ask the rest of the class, right, all the data is up. Everyone put up their post-it. When you ask the rest of the class, okay, what do you notice? Give me some statements about this data here. You want other students, or maybe even that student to kind of catch what they did, but you want other students to say, you know what, the 39 doesn't go there. Oh my goodness, great. So can you tell me why that doesn't go there? And then they could explain why, and then you could ask them, where do you think we should move it to then? And then they would decide. The same thing with the 12. The 12 is an even number, as you see here, so it's in the right spot as far as even. However, it is a number that's less than 30. So that really should go in the middle. So again, you're having the same discussions. You're hoping students catch it, someone in your class catches it, and they explain why it's incorrect and in, why it's in the wrong spot and how to fix it. Now, if a student doesn't see it, you can definitely point it out and be like, let's discuss the number 12. Um, describe the number 12 for me. And then with prompts, hopefully students then can see that there's an error there. Now, this next piece is important to keep in, in mind. I know people that use this routine that have students write their name on the post-it. I know teachers that do this routine that have students place their initials on the post-it. And I know teachers that do this routine that have no names on the post-it. Now, I'm going to be honest, I have tried it every which way. I do not prefer the names being on there. Students can feel like targeted with that, especially if they were the ones that put the 39. So that's not great, right? But then having no name, um, you can't really assess who's interpreting the data wrong. So what I would recommend, and this gets a little tricky when it's digital, but what I would recommend is having students place their initials on the back of the post-it so it's not really seen by the class, and then having... Um, just the front of the post-it be this, right? Because what you want to do is snatch up that 12 at the end of the activity and that 39, just put it to the side and take some anecdotal notes on that. That the student with the initials RS uh, who placed 39 maybe needs additional support in kind of understanding what you were addressing in the prompt. So I hope that example helps you with seeing how you can implement it in your room. So that single loop, uh, that double loop, which kind of makes it a little bit harder, a little bit juicier, and you can get hella crazy and actually do a triple loop Venn diagram, um, which is extreme and wonderful.
Now, not only, as I mentioned earlier, is this a great numeracy routine or classroom routine that you can do as a warm up, but you could also use this as a center activity as well. Okay, so here's an idea on what you could do for a center. So as students enter the room, you can have them, usually we have them do something while they're waiting for attendance and all that stuff to be taken. You can have students just read the prompt and put the post-it up. So no discussion, just read it, write their answer, put their post-it up, then leave it alone. And what you can do is place that data at a center. And then when students get to that center later in the day during their math block, they actually can interpret it using this. This is a great way for students to write about math. So the data is already collected and all they're doing is writing about their findings. So for example, let's take a look at this. They write the data question, write the prompt. They can draw what the data collection looked like. And then that's where they write the information that they learned about the data or the statements that they noticed. Like we talked about before, they may notice that the 39 didn't fit. That's something that they would write down. They could write statements like, I noticed 14, 12, and eight are even numbers. That's what they would write down. So they're writing down their findings. Center activities should not just be left alone. And this routine should not just be left alone. You have to come back together at some point to talk about what the kids wrote down. That group discussion is necessary. So you can end your block, your math block, with having students talk about what they noticed. I would still collect, this is a great formative assessment tool because you can see what the students were thinking, but in a different color, in a pen or a different color, you know, colored pencil, they can write down their new findings that they learned when they had that group discussion. So you basically get to see the students' original work and then the add-on pieces as they talked about it together. So as you can see here, there are different forms of collecting data. In this video, uh, we talked about the single loop and the double loop Venn diagram. There are graphs that we can use and yes, no charts, which will be in other videos. I just wanted to make sure that this video was particularly on the Venn diagrams because I really honestly think it's an underutilized tool in math and I really want us to start implementing it and using it more in our rooms. Now this is a great activity and that's all well and good, but I can tell you firsthand that sometimes creating the prompts are hella tough. So what I recommend is gathering together as a community to create these prompts. And that's something that we can do in this community as well. I will have a template for you to get us started so you can see a couple prompts already done like this example, but I really want to work together to create something great. Now, even if you don't do it in this community, I recommend that you do it with your grade level team, right? When you're planning and you're working on a unit, um, start thinking about the prompts that you could ask them. Now, I wanna be very clear. This daily data does not have to be, it is called daily data, but it does not have to be every day. You can do it a couple times a week. I also want to be clear in the fact that it does not have to be on your current topic. It could be something that the students learned and addressed in the past. It's a great way to review concepts. So gather together with your grade level team, create these prompts both as review and as current material, and let these kids think about data and interpreting data in a different way that's a little outside of the box. I cannot wait to see what everyone does with this daily data routine. Thanks for watching.